with continuous deployment, we take an holistic view. When we are continuously deploying, uh, we are having an approach where we look at the whole system that um, an application is composed of. So that's the binaries, the application configuration, the data the application uses, and the platform that the application runs on. Um, what we want to do is test to see if the binaries, their configuration, the data, um, and the environment is fit for production. So by taking this holistic view, we are confirming that the whole VM stroke environment is acceptable. So one of the problems we've got with manual deployments is it can take a relatively long time to get feedback. So using manual methods on a non-trivial deployment could take a day, and prior to that, there may have been weeks or months of effort gone into producing the release. This means that deployments don't happen very often, and they're rare events, which means they're not well practiced. Uh, for example, one project I worked on, we delivered the binaries. Uh, three months later, we got a bug report back because they'd only just deployed it into production. And I think that's too long to get feedback as a developer. So one aim of continuous deployment should be to reduce the cycle time of idea or development to deployment. Um, we reduce this cycle time by and it provides us with the numerous benefits. It provides the development team with feedback on the work they've just developed while it's still fresh in their minds. It reduces the risk associated with deployments and it increases quality by providing faster feedback with problems encountered during integration and deployment. So to reduce the cycle time, we want to automate as much as possible, preferably all of it. We model this process from development to deployment as a pipeline, and we represent this in Bamboo using a plan. So from the top down, Bamboo's organized like this. So you've got your project, and a project can have multiple plans, and each plan can have multiple stages. Each one of these stages can have one or more jobs, and a job is composed of tasks. Now it's worth noting that jobs within a stage can run in parallel but tasks are always executed sequentially within a job. Now, each task in Bamboo um, is a command, and you can add your own commands to Bamboo by supplying with the location of a binary or creating a Bamboo plugin. Using commands to control the configuration of your build environment by having them call scripts that are stored in your conversion control. In these scripts, you should be setting the version <laughs> of the JDK or the build tools you'll be using to do the build. Then if you ever need to recreate the version of the binary from source, again, you can do it in a reproducible way. The build, a build pipeline for a project is going to consist of a plan. There's a series of stages, and each one of these stages will consist of jobs that is made of one or more tasks that will create artifacts, or it will perform some testing. Now, the build pipelines are going to vary depending upon the project but a minimalist pipeline will consist of the following stages. It'll have a commit stage, an acceptance testing stage, and a deployment stage. Uh, these stages should follow on from each other in such a way that if a stage fails, the following stage is not performed. That is, for example, if the commit stage fails, you don't want to be performing any, ex any acceptance testing on it. There's no point, it's already failed earlier on. So the commit stage, well the aim of the commit stage is to quickly determine that the code compiles and that the unit tests that we've got for the code are running. Now you should be using unit tests and you need, you need good coverage in this process. It's because you need to have confidence when the code, when you, you need to have confidence for the subsequent stages. Now, any failure on this commit stage should be fed back to the developers near instantaneously. And we may also like to include some fast running integration or component tests in the commit stage uh, that can run after the unit tests to give us some basic indicators that the, com that the application will run. Um, some other stuff we can also include in the commit stage is static source code analysis or, with, or tools like Clover that can provide us with information. Uh, at this stage, if any of the tests don't pass, we'll make it fail. And um, we all also got the option of if any of the quality metrics, like the information from Sonar or Clover, are not acceptable, we can also fail it for those reasons. So 
The usual binaries that we'll create here would be like jars, wars, axes, but it shouldn't, com it shouldn't <coughs> include any environment specific configuration. So we don't want to be including any configuration for our development, production, UAT, staging, none of that configuration data should be produced at this stage. Just the binaries that could be deployed in any one of those environments. Now, I'd advocate, instead of just creating jars and wars, I'd actually advocate producing installers for your application that will be targeting the package manager on the target environment. So for Linux, you could create installers uh, for in dev or RPM format, and for Windows, you could create an MSI file. And there are a few reasons for this. Uh, this method of application installation is well tested in the field. Um, the package managers can access repositories that you can create. So you can store your releases versioned um, on a separate system. And you can use that when provisioning your, your environments. Um, and uh, they provide for various files to be placed across the, um, across the operating system and registry in a consistent way. Uh, for example, in the Linux style ones, you can find out what file, um, what package the file belongs to by uh, using RPM or the dev system. Um, in the acceptance stage, uh, we'll start to pull in the application configuration. Uh, in this stage, we aim to create an environment that is production-like and run our acceptance tests against it. So we want, what we're looking for here is to get tested configurations. So you should be running changes in your configuration through the build pipeline too. So if your operations team need to make a configuration change, for example, tweaking the JVM memory settings, that should be committed to source. And that change should run through the build pipeline as well. Um, and this will give you confidence that um, all your configuration changes, all your configuration changes, have had acceptance tests run against them. So no configuration should be applied directly by editing the configuration files. This needs to be this needs to happen because you don't want to be in a situation where you've got an application that's well tested but the configuration isn't. Uh, I've seen that in a lot of organisations where they deploy well tested applications, but then when it gets to the operation side side of things. The deployments are just sort of like hack and slash and people going in and just editing the config files. Well, we need to get that under source control and run that through testing as well. So, and not just for your application, but you should also keep the configuration for your entire platform under source control as well. For example, if somebody changed the number of open file descriptors an application can have open, uh, when Apache starts running under load, it could start crashing or something. And while that might not be the main part of your application, it's still in the environment, so you don't want that to sort of affect you. So we've set up our acceptance test environment and have run some acceptance tests, maybe for example Cucumber tests, and tested the behaviour that it functions correctly. At the end of the acceptance stage, we'll have a configuration that's been automatically verified. And we may have some additional artefacts, such as logs that are available to be analysed if it failed. So, moving on to the deployment stage. In this stage, the binaries and configuration should be automatically deployed to a staging or UNT environment, or if you're feeling really confident, perhaps a production environment. And we want to automate this process as much as possible. At the end of the deployment stage, we'll have automatically deployed the application to the environment that's as close to production as possible, and preferably a replica. If it fails, we want to automatically roll back and save the logs and any other monitoring data that can help us, or help us understand why. Because we already have developed a system for rapid deployment into an environment, rather than trying to like roll back or undo our changes, what we can do is just redeploy a known good configuration. To get the consistency between our deployment environments, we can use a tool like Puppet or Chef. Our Puppet modules can store information about the software and packages that are being installed. And each module is comprised of some Puppet classes and some supporting files for that module. And this is where you'd store your configuration. 
Now, all these modules can be stored in version control too. And the great thing about puppet classes is that they can be parameterized. So we can use the same set of modules straight through from the developer machine through to production. And this can be done by having as little as a single manifest for each one of those environments. Now, we should manage our environments using virtualization. Um, I can't think of a good reason for using like hardware anymore. Uh, virtualization's come a long way in recent years and nearly every major virtualization and cloud vendor I, I, can find, I can think of as an API that can be used to provision uh, virtual machines like VMware or EC2 or VirtualBox. Now, for running virtualization on the developer desktop, I'd recommend using Vagrant because it has a couple of benefits. Vagrant is a wrapper that sits around Oracle's VirtualBox and it's open source and free to use. It has provisioning support that enabled by either Puppet or Chef. So then again, we can still use our modules from earlier on. So we're using the same set of modules across all the environments. It has a text-based configuration that can be stored in source control. So this means that that environment can also be tested um, as part of your build. In its configuration, you can specify multiple virtual machines to fire up. This means that you can approximate some complex environments and your devs can run these environments on a workstation. Uh, this is great for simulating stuff like service-oriented architecture where you've got multiple, um, multiple systems running and accessing each other. I found that typically on a modern workstation you can run an IDE and three or four VMs on the developer workstation with about eight gigabytes of RAM. You can also set up Vagrant as a command on your Bamboo instance, and that's how you'd use it to test the developer configurations. So by following the strategy I've outlined using Bamboo, you can save time and effort with your deployment, and you'll have more confidence in the deployment process, and you'll be performing it more often, and the quality of your product should improve because you're reducing the amount of time it takes for developers to receive feedback. My name is James Lowry and I'm a technical consultant and adaptivist. Thank you.